Hey y'all, welcome back to another episode. My name is Christina and here on this channel I love to talk about the baby whisperer Tracy Hogg. This is, I think it's one like her second or third book, but it's the only book that I have of hers and I followed it to the letter basically as close as I could get with my first daughter. So today I'm going to go off book a little bit and talk about my experience traveling with my daughter while I did the easy routine. And I've actually done quite a bit of travel with my daughter. So we actually recently got back from a trip too. So I, th I thought that this would just be the perfect chance to talk a little bit about how you can keep up with your routine while traveling, especially if it's going to be your first time traveling with your child, and definitely what travel looks like and how it changes as your baby grows older. So today I'm going to talk mostly about air travel, so my experience going in planes with my daughter. That's the bulk of our travel. We don't really do car trips or road trips or anything like that. We live in the center of Texas, so we can't get very far and it takes a really long time. <laughs> so um, I just hate car travel too as well. I, I prefer to fly. The first time we ever traveled with our daughter, she was seven weeks old. Then we traveled with her again, not until she was six months old and that was internationally. Then we traveled again at nine months, 10 months, 12 months, and just recently at 15 months. I have a good amount of experience with traveling with different age babies and Honestly, that was my biggest obstacle was keeping up with how she is changing just normally day in and day out and how that affects our travel. And that was probably one of the biggest challenges. It's like every single trip, she's a completely different baby. So when it comes to travel, at least with air travel, you're basically spending a whole day off routine in order to make it to the place that you're going. And if you're traveling across time zones, then that throws in a whole wrench to your routine. When your baby is young, you don't necessarily stick to a timed schedule routine, but when your baby grows older and they just start always napping at the same time every day, it's going to throw a wrench in their day if you're not home, you don't have a space for them to nap, and it's that time that they usually nap, but there's not a chance for them to nap. And so I just want to talk a little bit about how to create opportunities for naps, how to distract your child when you just have to sit there all day, and how to figure out how to adjust to time zones. I have a few quick tips before I start. First of all, when it comes to traveling through time zones, it's always easier just like to adjust to the new time whenever you're traveling from east to west versus west to east. So if you start your trip west and you travel east, that's going to take more time for you and your child to adjust to the time zone than it is for you when you start east and then go west. And I think that's just because when you go east to west, you gain time and when you go west to east, you lose time and that can really throw things off. It's always important to keep that in mind because when you do travel, you always want to leave time to adjust to the new schedule. So if you are going somewhere, say you wanna to go to Europe for a family vacation or something like that, and your entire trip is completely packed with activities and sightseeing and things like that, you need to maybe go a few days early to help your child adjust to the new time zone and just spend time with them in your hotel, in your Airbnb, whatever it is, just doing your routine. And it's going to be totally off and totally different from what it usually is depending on how much time you lost, but it's definitely worth it and you'll actually be able to enjoy those sightseeing adventures that you have planned. When you're flying, one of the biggest concerns is obviously you don't want your child to scream and cry the entire flight. So when they're very young, if they're still uh, under one year of age, it's always been helpful for me that when I ascend in the plane and then when we descend, that I always would breastfeed during those times, even if it wasn't on a timed schedule. But that helps with their ears popping. Sometimes it can cause pain and that gets them agitated so they cry and it's really frustrating. And then when my daughter was old enough to not take a breast anymore really, I would even just bring her sippy cup of water and that would always help her. She always drinks water whenever the plane's going up or down and that really helps her with her ears for sure. I've also heard that you can give your baby Tylenol or ibuprofen. I've never tried that 
but I imagine if you do have a really sensitive or touchy baby that that might also help. And then my last quick tip is to always consider your child's temperament. So whether they're touchy, grumpy, spirited, textbook, angel, that's going to affect the way that they travel. An angel baby is going to be a breeze traveling, but a grumpy baby or a touchy baby is going to be way more stimulated by their environment and they might have a harder time trying to sleep on the go, trying to eat on the go, be just being in a different place. They might have a hard time with the noises and the lights and the things that they're not used to. So always keep that in mind before you travel so you have a good expectation for what your child will be like when you are in the plane or the bus or the train or whatever you're doing. And then just remember like we feel icky when we're traveling, like when we've spent all day in a plane and we feel gross and we just feel awful, they probably feel the same way too, I could imagine. And so it's always good to have more grace with your child as well when you're traveling. Imagine that they feel just as awful as you do, but they just don't know how to handle it yet. And so every single travel experience is a great new opportunity for us to model and reflect good behavior for our children and to teach them how to deal with that ickiness when they just want to go home and curl up in bed and fall asleep. All right, now I'm just gonna take time and I'm gonna go through what travel looks like with every age and talk a little bit about my experience while I traveled with my daughter when she was those ages. So first, we're gonna look at zero to three months. We traveled with our daughter when she was seven weeks old and this is by far the easiest time to travel, but it's also the most intimidating because it's your first time traveling with your child probably in those first three months, I'm assuming. And so I think a lot of new parents have concerns that they're gonna be, you know, those people on board with a crying, screaming baby. You've never been that before, but you've been on flights where there is a crying, screaming baby the whole time and you just don't wanna be that and you don't want your baby to have a terrible, miserable time because that means you will too. But when it comes down to it, if you're doing a routine, if you're sticking with the easy routine, even if you're not doing it perfectly quite yet, it's kind of hard to do it in the first like two months, but your child's gonna be just fine. Just make sure that they're fed. They're gonna fall asleep no matter what. If you're doing an airplane, like the white noise of just being in the plane totally helps zonk them out. I just remember I fed my daughter and then I just held her the rest of the flight. It was like a two and a half hour flight and so it was like the perfect time then to feed her on the descent and it was just like so easy i could sit there i was able to watch a movie talk with my husband it was so easy the worst part was just like holding her and like my arms are tired and you know at that point she was still young enough where we could pass her off and she wouldn't wake up from the movement so really it's so so easy at this age there's nothing to be afraid of um, it can be a little intimidating if you are planning to breastfeed on the plane for the first time. I just brought a nursing cover, sat by the window, and really, like, my husband just kind of used his body to kind of help block me a little bit. But really, people don't care. They don't want to look at you. They don't want to talk to you. They don't want to hear your baby. And the flight attendants on most flights, when they see that you have a baby, are just so nice, too. Like, they depending on the airline maybe, but they usually tend to be very kind. And then of course there's the concern that if you are going from one time zone to another that your baby might have a more difficult time. So when we traveled with our daughter at seven weeks, we were going from west to east. We were just going one hour time difference and it did not really affect anything at all. In fact, the first night that we got there was the very first night she ever slept eight hours from the dream feed to the morning feed. <laughs> And it was amazing, it was great. And I was shocked. I think it had to do with the time change, but also, you know, babies get tired and exhausted from travel as well. So it was probably a part of that. And she slept eight hours every single night that we were there. That might not happen with you, but really like that time change, if it's small, it's not gonna be a huge deal. If it's significantly bigger, then you are going to see that your child is gonna have a harder time adjusting, especially with feed times and even with poop times. Like if they usually poop at night and now it's the morning where you are, like their entire schedule, body schedule is off. And so that's an important thing to keep in mind as well. Then the next age group that we'll talk about is four to eight months. This is a difficult time to travel. We did travel with our daughter when she was six months. And the reason that it's difficult is because at four months you might be doing sleep training. So we did pick up put down at four months and I just cleared our schedule for, 
I guess it was basically two months after that. I did not know what would happen, how quickly she would adjust, how well she'd be able to fall asleep. And so I was just not gonna travel during that time. And if you are stuck in a position where you do need to travel, then you have to keep in mind that the way that you're doing sleep training will be affected by that. And so whatever your situation is, you just need to be as consistent as you possibly can, whether you're staying in someone's house or a hotel. And really, if you're going to be on a plane or a train or a bus or in the car for a really long time, you won't be able to do pick up, put down, and it might you know, push your progress back a little bit. So that's why when you do pick up, put down, you really need to plan ahead. Don't do it before a big trip. If you're going to have a big trip at like four and a half months, then just wait until after the sleep train or see if you can do it a little bit before. But just keep in mind, try to give your child at least a month until they're five months before you travel with them after their sleep train. And then another thing to keep in mind is when your child turns six months, they're gonna start solids. And they might even start solids a little bit before that, a little bit after that, depending on who they are. But that was one thing I had to keep in mind. We traveled with my daughter probably like three or four weeks after she started solids. So I had to make sure that I pureed food ahead of time, that I planned for pureed food when we got there, or at least food that I could match up with a fork, things like that. And that wasn't too hard. I knew that it was going to be a problem. I actually started her on solids a little bit before she was six months because I wanted to make sure she was adjusted to them well. But I also, I traveled with a whole list of food that she was able to eat that she had already tried and also foods she hadn't that might have been allergens. Like at that point she hadn't tried peanut butter or anything. So when we traveled, we did not let her try peanut butter because we didn't want her to have an allergic reaction on the plane or in another country. And so yeah, it was at this point when she was six months that we traveled internationally and it was awful. <laughs> Just the adjustment to the time change. It was really, really hard. And so luckily with international flights, most airlines offer a baby bassinet if your child is under one year old. And this was the first time that we traveled with her after she was sleep trained. And so I was freaking out. I was like on the plane, where is she gonna sleep? Like we just sleep trained her. I don't know if she's gonna sleep on me. I don't know if we'll have room on the floor. I don't know if you can even put your baby on the floor if the flight attendants will care. And so it was really great that we could get a bassinet and they basically just like hook it on in front of you on the wall. You have to sit in a certain spot on the airplane, but it's also like the best spot to sit. And we had to cover her with like a blanket. There was like a TV above her. So we were able to drape a blanket down over her so she couldn't see anything. But that was really great. If, if you are going to do international travel at any age under one, definitely re request a bassinet. It gives your baby the chance to sleep not on you. And we were traveling at night, so we knew that we were going to be tired, we were going to want to sleep. And I don't feel comfortable holding my daughter while I'm sleeping, especially on a, a plane where you're not fully reclined. So I was really glad to have a bassinet, that really helped. She did not sleep perfectly on the airplane, but she slept really, really, really well uh, for the situation <laughs> that it was. And then of course it was, uh, I think it was a seven hour time change and we were going west to east. We flew to Europe and it was really, really rough. At that point she wasn't eating at night except for the dream feed. But the first night we got there, I had to wake up at like 3 a.m. to feed her because she was hungry. And so her feeding schedule was still really off and her sleep schedule was really off. She cried a lot. <laughs> and I wish that I had given her more time to adjust. It was difficult because our family, the ones who have kids, <laughs> they don't follow the same plan that we follow. They actually don't really adhere to bedtimes. I think maybe now they do, it's been a while, but they weren't at the time adhering to bedtimes or really respecting the fact that we had a routine. And so we couldn't get her to bed in time that first night and it was just miserable. She cried so much, but she was sleep trained. So we were able to leave her in her crib and she was able to fall asleep. But then she was also hungry and it was a weird time. And I had to do the math in my head of like, oh, this to her is her morning feed. That's why she's hungry right now. And really you have to have a lot of grace at this time. So you can decide if you need to do kind of more of a hard switch and if your baby's hungry at 3 a.m. when they shouldn't be, it's 3 a.m. in that 
new place that you are but it's a normal feeding time back home then you have to decide are you going to let them cry or are you going to feed them and i decided to feed my daughter because after a whole day of travel i knew it was just better to just do that one nighttime feed and then try to get her on a normal feeding schedule during the day and that worked for her she's a textbook baby so i knew she would follow my lead pretty well but if you have a grumpy baby or a touchy baby or a spirited baby it might be more detrimental to them to kind of give in or it actually might be more helpful so you know your baby best and you just need to be prepared for a rift in your schedule <laughs> and then it also took my daughter probably about three or four days to fully adjust to the schedule in Europe it was a 10 day trip so it didn't ruin our trip too much but it was really hard at night time she always had a hard time going to bed at night but she took her naps pretty well during the day and it was just hard because I couldn't do anything at that point we were just putting her down in her crib and we had to leave the room if we were physically there it would be a distraction she would expect us to be like oh yes it's time to be awake let's play so i couldn't do anything i would try to feed her try to comfort her and it just didn't work <laughs> we just had to like let her figure it out the time so that was really rough and i would recommend if you were to do any international travel to plan ahead even more so maybe than what we did and to definitely do it either when they're very young or when they're a little bit older. And then when we came home, we flew east to west, it took her less than a day to adjust. It was so fast, it was really easy because we gained back seven hours so we could really play with her schedule more and get it to where we thought it should be. And then another general tip, if you are traveling internationally and you have a long flight or a really big time change, you can start adjusting them to the new time you're going to be on on the plane so if all like you know it's 10 p.m where you're going but it's only like 3 p.m where you're flying from and you usually do a feed at 3 p.m and a 10 30 dream feed then you can try to hold off until what's 3 30 back home and 10 30 where you're going and try to make that into a dream feed and see if how long they'll go but i don't really recommend that for shorter flights i just recommend doing when you arrive there kind of doing like a hard switch onto the new time zone so if it's only like a three hour time difference it might just be easier to once you get there you're like okay now it's one o'clock we don't eat at one o'clock or we do eat at one o'clock whatever your current routine is but give your baby a lot of grace and just follow their temperament follow them don't just follow what everyone else is saying. 9 to 12 months is where it can get a little difficult movement wise. So most babies at this point are crawling, they might be walking a little bit, pulling up, but they're used to moving a lot. And so the challenge at this point is making them sit still for a while. So this was the first time when my daughter was 9 months that I went to the store and I bought toys for her to play with that she had never seen before on the plane and that is a tip that I highly recommend for any age where you your problem is that they're wiggly <laughs> and so having those new toys there really is exciting for them it helps them to sit and be interested for a while and then making sure that you pack snacks as well snacks and water I did not know how much my daughter would love having a bottle of water on the plane she drinks it so much and when you think about it, I, I believe I've heard before that when you're in a plane, you get really dehydrated and stuff like that. And I ignore my own dehydration and like don't drink water, <laughs> but my daughter just like throws back water. So I always make sure I fill up her water bottle before I get on the plane or I ask a flight attendant once I'm on to get her water. I like need to keep the water coming for her and that really helps. She will be very upset if she does not have water on the plane. <laughs> And snacks are always great. They're a great distraction. Or if you're flying during a meal time, you kind of need to pack a little more food than just a snack. But they do help calm your baby. I don't recommend ever using snacks to like pacify your child's behavior or to pacify them in general, calm them down. But when you're on a plane in public, it's hard to do anything else. So having a snack there to calm them down, having a snack that reminds them at home, something that they love and they enjoy will help them feel more secure. Additionally, if you've started doing Tracy Hogg's potty training at this point, just have grace with yourself 
at this age. I would try to do potty training at the place that I was going to, but I would not do it while I traveled. I'm not gonna worry about bringing a potty seat to the airplane and the airplane bathrooms are really loud and cramped and my daughter hated being in them anyway. So while we traveled, I just would not care if she used the toilet at all and skipping a day isn't going to completely revert them back to their old behavior. But to the extent that you can while you're traveling, try to get them to use the toilet. Also at this time, your child is bigger and so sleeping on the plane, taking a nap or going to bed <laughs> becomes more of a challenge. This was always something I was worried about, especially because our daughter is sleep trained. She only sleeps in her crib at home or sometimes in the car if we're traveling somewhere far. But she really, really does never sleep in our arms. She never sleeps somewhere where there's lights and people staring at her. And that's what the plane is. So I was always worried for every single one of the trips at this age, you know, where is she going to sleep? Is she going to sleep? And the best thing that you can do is try to create to the best of your ability an environment for them to sleep. So if they need to sleep in the airport, I would always have my stroller that closed up or that I could put a blanket over and I would just walk with her and hope that maybe the movement would help her fall asleep. You, you kind of have to revert to sleep props here a bit and it's hard to do that when your child is completely uh, sleep trained. But I would try to use movement, especially because the exhaustion of travel is going to help you as well. Trying to use movement um, in the airport to get her to sleep, putting her on me in a carrier when she was a little bit younger and like covering up her view so she couldn't see anything. That always helped. If I was on the airplane, we what my husband and I would do is one of us would clear out the foot space, the bag space in front of us, and we would try to lay her down on the floor so she could kind of roll around a little bit. That worked a lot, actually. I think almost every time we traveled, nine, 10, and 12 months, she slept on the floor, she didn't mind it. This last time at 15 months, she definitely hated it. But she's also slept in our arms several times between nine and 12 months. Sometimes she just, I think, yeah, I'm still breastfeeding. So sometimes she would just, I would feed her and she would just fall asleep nursing, which I never ever do in real life. Um, but she, I was able to do these kind of sleep prop things while I traveled because I didn't do them here. It didn't affect her home life. It didn't affect the, what she, she never like expected me to help her go to sleep like that at home after that. And I think to an extent at this point, your child understands that you're in a weird environment, you're traveling, weird stuff is happening. And so you got to really pull the extremes out in order to have a good travel experience. Whatever you need to do to get your child to sleep, do it. Don't be ashamed. Don't feel like you have to just lay them down and hope that they <laughs> put themselves to sleep. It's okay if they sleep on you. It's okay if you feed them to sleep. <laughs> Whatever you have to do is, is really best. I think making sure they're well rested is the most important thing while you're traveling. Then we get to 12 months and up. This was hard. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we just traveled with my daughter. She's 15 months and she, this was her first time traveling, not being breastfed and being able to walk. And so I didn't have this thing on me that I could just use to soothe her at any point. And so it really became external things, snacks, water, toys. And actually toys were really difficult at this point. She really just wanted to move and look around and see everybody. And that was hard. <laughs> so my husband and I just had to be on duty 100% to interact with her and to talk with her and take care of her to help her get snacks and to play with some things. And at this point, it kind of sucks a little bit. You just can't have entertainment on the plane. At least in our philosophy, we don't have tablets or screen time at all for our daughter. So we're not just going to hand her a tablet at this point. I don't even know if she would use it <laughs> if we did. We, it was really important to us that we weren't on our own screens because she would, you know, be on them too, trying to touch them. So we just had to, you know, basically work the whole flight and not relax. Like what we all wanna do when we're on a plane is just zone out and get there. So that's what made this a little more difficult. It's just that it was more work on our part. And at this age, 
over a year, you're going to be dealing with more behavioral issues. So our daughter, unfortunately, just entered a slapping phase and it's not true slapping it is developmental she's just learning that she has strength and that she can hit things she also is starting to throw things a little more so we had to be really on top of her this whole flight and also just every single day about hitting us and slapping and throwing things and throwing things at people and stuff like that and it kind of sucks to have to you know do this over and over again on a plane because really what one of the best distractions is at this age is to just move them away from whatever it is that they're throwing or slapping or whatever and you can't do that on a plane you're stuck in your seat <laughs> so it can be hard to just say the same thing over and over and over and over again and if something gets taken from her and she throws a fit over it it's hard to just kind of you have to like let it happen and be calm <laughs> and so i honestly on almost every flight we've been on someone's complimented us about how well behaved she is she, it feels like she's not and you know compared to other children i've seen on planes or in airports she definitely is better behaved but it's never what i hope it is <laughs> and it's never going to be so really it's important to just get rid of all expectations to just toss them out the window and to not expect your child to act or do things in a certain way at all basically all of your problems can be solved by just planning ahead so planning what times your flights are if you can get flights that work with your child's schedule then that's the ideal and if you can't then trying to come up with creative alternatives for them to sleep when they need to eat when they need to go to the bathroom if they need to change their diaper if you need to change it things like that will really help it go smoother just making sure you have a plan obviously travel's not relaxing to anyone but most of us just want to zone out while we're traveling and not be on top of stuff and unfortunately we have to be in our hyper intense mode while we're traveling with our children. There's really not much we can do about travel days and about time zones except for to be consistent. If you're going to use a sleep prop only use it if you're stuck on a plane or in a place where you can't do anything else. Don't continue to use it once you get off the plane even if you're in a weird hotel or a relative's house or things like that. Really try to be consistent. Plan ahead so that you can use the tools that are in this book, pick up, put down, wake to sleep, whatever you need to use in order to help your child maintain consistency and feel comfortable in their new place. Thanks for watching.